The Unshackled Waves, episode 155. Broadcasting from Melbourne, Australia, this is The Unshackled Waves with Tim Wills. Brought to you by theunshackled.net. Hello everyone, great to have your company. Now, as you know, we try to introduce you to as many like-minded people as possible. We're always coming across new alt media people to feature on this show. Today's guest, we were quite flattered, reached out to us. Uh, Jack Reedy, he, he publishes the Pop and Lock blog on online publishing platform Medium. And we are pleased to announce that Pop and Lock articles are now uh, republished on theunshackled.net. So I thought it was about time that we introduce him properly. Jack, welcome to the show and welcome aboard The Unshackled. Thanks, mate. Glad to be here. Now, uh, so our audience and I can uh, get to know you a bit better, I want to first discuss your uh, political background. Now, you're uh, in the uh, libertarian mould, uh, quite like myself. So uh, how did your views uh, develop over over your youth? Yeah, so um, I guess I've always been a pretty... Uh, kind of individualistic person. I've always been a bit of a contrarian. I've always sort of liked to question established rules, and I think that sort of um, lends itself towards libertarianism naturally. But when I was in high school, I sort of gravitated towards the left libertarianism sort of movement, and I probably, I mean, I could have ended up, up really a Labour Greens type voter. Um, if the left had allowed any sort of real libertarian thought at all, which it really <laughs> doesn't anymore. Um, I mean, that old adage, if you're not a socialist in your 20s, you have no heart. And if you're still a socialist in your 30s, you have no brain, I think very much um, applies. Um, so once I sort of turned 18 and went to university and saw, started to um, study economics, um, I started to realize, hang on, am I dropping out? No. Okay. Um, once I started to, yeah, sort of study economics at university, I really realized kind of the double speak, I guess, that goes on with the way that the left wants you to view economics. So like an example would be um, the other, I think it was 2015 or 2016, Joe Hockey said something that was to the effect of, it might be, these numbers might be slightly wrong, but he said something like the top 10% of income earners pay like the pay about 50 to 60% of all taxes. And the whole left was like, oh, no, how could you say that? Like vilifying the poor and oh, no, all this kind of thing. It was like breaking the narrative. And they, you know, it was fact checked and it was completely true. And that was when I started to go like, oh, OK, hold on. This is weird. Like that's an idea that the left will never tell you. Um, so yeah, I started to sort of realize that the left is basically made up of two factions. There's kind of the militant anarchist, you'll see like the Antifa, the Black Lives Matter, the, there's, we have that Australian one, the Warriors of the Aboriginal Resistance, which is basically the Aboriginal BLM, um, who are, you know, violent protesters. And then you have the more mainstream sort of establishment uh, kind of thought police type leftists, which are usually like the intellectuals who kind of use their intellectualism as a weapon to club ideas that they think are bad. And it turns out that the ideas that they think are bad are basic ideas about economics that I firmly believe in, such as that the government doesn't have a right to my money. If you know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> it's like, it's like if you, if we can't agree on the idea that the money that I earn is my own and that the government and you as a proxy don't have the right to just pillage my income, like, I don't want to live in a country with you, you know? <laughs> uh, I, I don't think it's a youthful uh, enthusiasm which uh, m makes us lean to the left. I, I definitely... It's, it's something to do with the Australian education system. In schools, there's this leftist groupthink where you're be, even though it's not overt, you're just you're automatically taught that the the left are the the sympathetic ones, and if only we were all enlightened. But I was a bit like you that uh, I uh, grew up liking capitalism, liking the the benefits of the mm, uh, of yeah. the free market, even though I was. 
um, consuming all of this social justice narrative. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, no, that's, I mean, that's, yeah, that's very much it. I mean, I, yeah, I grew up like throughout high school. I really sort of believed in the meme. Like, for example, I really, I, I got caught up in the whole, like, oh man, Tony Abbott is such a like right-wing radical prime minister. Like, oh, I can't believe we have this like fascist guy who wants to stop the votes and all this sh Like, cause- Yeah, because, it was John like Howard saying, in my like, day. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, was he treated in basically the same way? I mean, I was a bit young then, so I didn't really... Oh, yeah. Ha Howard was yeah qu uh, constantly uh, uh, pillarized by uh, the left, the, the culture, and the a a academia. Uh, I definitely mm. would agree that under... Well, the left just has gotten more feral over the, the past decade, so yeah, it was definitely more intense under Abbott. That, yeah, that's exactly it. I mean, it just... It, I completely agree with you in that feralness that's really what tipped me off that's when i was like oh okay like i see what's i see what's happening here it's not it's it's not that tony abbott is a right-wing radical it's actually that the left are left-wing radicals and they think that you know socialism is going to save us and all this absurd nonsense and i mean other than that like the past 10 years we've really seen a sort of i mean it's a it's a politically correct cultural hegemony perpetuating itself through popular culture i would say i mean all you have to do is look at the ability to criticize the religion of islam and the conflation of the religion like the doctrine of islam with the race of with with like middle easterners as a as an ethnic group like it's absurd i mean look at that charlie hedbo thing like does any other religion react that way when you um, publish a cartoon of their prophet? Like, no. It's not. It's not normal, and it's not. Yeah, it's it's not. Um, yeah, sorry. It's it's not normal the way that 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 religion is being so protected in popular culture it's like if you can't if you can't criticize certain doctrines and certain ideas like there's something to that that needs to be heavily questioned and the i mean it's absurd in itself the the alliance between the left and islam i mean a lot of people have made that observation but you know it needs to be made i mean you see things like that yasmin abdul majid when she said on q a um how islam was the most feminist religion like that's absolutely an absurd thing to say and she she said it on a national show and then it was on the national broadcaster and then it was perpetuated through social media and like i had a number of friends who shared that clip and they're like oh man i hate racists like saying that jackie lambie was racist for saying that she doesn't want sharia law in australia it's like like this is what young people are are eating up and just posting like as if as if the criticism of sharia law is racist that's absurd uh, uh people like you and me we changed our views as we saw more evidence uh, uh mm, come yeah, forward exactly. uh, but i i just don't understand how the uh, the leftists today they they see like for example the uh attacks uh by islamists uh happening and and other forms of totalitarianism Arism and they're just like, no, our our worldview is is still valid. This doesn't change anything, and they they somehow manage to to still uh, justify the the same path that they're on. Yeah, I um, <laughs> I posted a, a a status through uh, my uh, Pop and Locks uh, Twitter and Facebook account. I think I posted it just this morning. That was uh, like, uh, is this Yanni and Laurel thing like how? when a terrorist screams Allahu Akbar, some people hear um, like a destructive war cry that wants to tear down the West and other people hear Islam is a religion of peace, which I thought was funny. Yeah, <laughs> that's definitely good. Now, obviously, um, you're probably a bit like me. You're growing frustrated with the 
the world going in the direction uh, it was. What was the sort of like click moment where you were like, I I've you know got to write my views down. I've got to you know make make sure that they're out there. Um, try and have some influence. Yeah, it was only. Do you mean what was the click moment? Like, what was the th the thing that turned me right wing, or what what caused me to start a blog? The, to start the blog. Oh uh, well, really, I just I started listening to um, a lot of sort of intellectuals who weren't so caught up in the whole um, obsessed with being politically correct thing. So jo Jonathan Haidt is like a really good one. Um, it just sort of the general like the usual sort of youtube i think they're now sort of being referred to as like the intellectual dark web you know people like jordan peterson that sort of thing just people who are obviously clear thinkers um and i think like a really good habit for really for everyone to get into is um to write daily like i just started writing daily to sort of clarify my thoughts and it's a, it's a um technique for a lot of reasons um, so basically I just started writing my political sort of views in like a long form way where I'd have to justify them and source them like as if someone else would be reading them or as if I was explaining them to someone else. So it forces you to, to really question all of your underlying assumptions. I think it's a really good thing to do if you're going to be at all politically involved. Um, and then I just realized like... <laughs> Websites like Junkie and Pedestrian, which have a lot of clout with people my age, there's no difference between what I was doing and what their political articles are like. In a lot of ways, what I was doing is, is even in more detail and more easy to follow than what they're doing. So I thought, well, you know, why can't I just start a blog? And so I just got on Medium and it's a good platform for that kind of thing. Uh, I definitely, when I write an article, I want to do it properly. Like, I don't want uh, it to be, you know, just a, f a Facebook post in blog form. Like, I want to, you know, comment uh, my views, but I also want to give a bit of background, you know, a link, um, you know, all of the, the relevant uh, uh, facts, because th that's how you build a, a compelling case for your argument. Yeah, I mean, that was basically it. I just wanted to... Um, I, I mean, I realized that popular culture was not only not, um, not like you say, building the case for a libertarian or a conservative worldview, but it was actually in a lot of ways acting against that. And so I just, yeah, I wanted to collect those libertarian and left-wing arguments that sort of, and like I said before, I mean, I've always been a bit of a contrarian. Now, your blog is called uh, Pop and Locke, which uh, Locke is after uh, John Locke, who uh, was a proponent of liberty and natural rights in the uh, 17th uh, century. Uh, so there's a deep philosophical underlining to your views, but um, it's, it seems to be that in this current uh, political climate that we're in, where we're busy fighting the, the culture wars, uh, sort of the uh, free thoughts, free markets, even though that's our philosophy, it's sort of become uh, lost. I mean, you mentioned before uh, Yasmin abdel Magid. there's also, you know, Waleed Ali, we're just so busy responding to this, uh, these people's daily uh, what views. Do you think we're uh, missing the, the the long game here or it's just important to just focus on what we're up against now uh, i mean i think it's probably a bit of both i mean the reason why i named the blog so specifically after john locke and why i sort of want to bring people our age back to looking at um the philosophical underpinnings is that when you get down to that you really realize that, like that's how the right can make the case for how absurd the leftist worldview is because they've essentially hedged their bets on socialism which is an ideology that's failed in literally every culture it's been tried in it's been tried in a number of different cultures number of different types of societies all around the world and it's it's not only failed each time but it's horrifically failed and it's created some of the greatest like misery throughout the 20th century i mean we played that game over and over again um so yeah I, I think getting to the getting to the philosophical 
sort of underpinnings of the ideas is the best way to fight the left. Um, yeah. I, I def uh, you're definitely correct that uh, socialism uh, is is on the march again. I mean, there's all these different socialist and uh, Marxist uh, groups, and they and they really believe that if we you know tax have a, a wealth tax of ninety nine percent, we can you know achieve uh, equality and uh, so it's definitely. Um, uh, to go back to, to actually contradict what I what I previously uh, said, you know, we do spend a lot of time educating uh, people on how bad uh, socialism is. We've got a perfect example of uh, how it's operating in Venezuela, where that where that country is basically on the on the verge of uh, star starvation, and so we've uh, there, there's quite a lot of re-education that that we have to do with young people who've forgotten uh, a lot of these lessons. And even though it, because um, if you do uh, too much uh, philosophy of the, the the famous people such as um, a Adam Smith and uh, Frederick Bastiat, it can go over people's heads. So if you keep it relevant to today's lessons and what's happening now, then you've got a greater chance of, of getting through to people. I mean, you just look at probably still like we do articles and obviously I do uh, podcasts as well, but it, but it seems that the most cut through you get now are the, the memes. Yeah, definitely. The memes are, that, I mean, that's a part of why, like, it, I mean, it's very obviously part of why Trump won is just that the, the left, the, the right was hilarious like trump embraced the memes if i can put it that way it's 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 like yeah the 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 part of it is part of that i think is that because the left is so politically correct like politically correct comedy is just not funny that's why those abc comedy videos like dad's google history and whatever like all that crap is just so stupid it's like it's it's just not funny it's like when you box people in and you're like okay this is the the acceptable range of what you can joke about is like this small. And so you have to just make these like benign jokes, like, haha, my dad Googles stuff because he's old. It's like, it's like, it's just not funny. No one cares about it. Oh, yeah. Uh, it's, uh, popular culture is becoming uh, progressively uh, worse. Uh, they, it, it all began with the mainstream news media i mean well they've always yeah. historically leaned to the left but it's it's definitely getting worse uh, uh over the past uh, decade i mean uh the perfect example is the the abc's q a where i remember when i used to watch it every um episode was you know why aren't we doing anything about climate change these you know poor oh, you know refu yeah. refu uh, refugees coming by boat you know why don't we have uh a, a same-sex marriage um you know uh, why are you know there's so many you know working poor in this country it seems that it, it's it's not just the the media putting forth a point of view is that they're trying to shape the what's what's the political conversation by saying that you, know, you have you know we should you know view all these issues through through this uh, prism yeah definitely i mean just to go back to the the, the John Locke sort of the founding philosophy and why I sort of focus on philosophy through the blog thing. Um, I mean, I think once you make that, once you start to make that sort of philosophical case, you can, you can even show people how the left itself, the left itself believes in the social contract which is an enlightenment idea i mean they pretend that they want to they pretend that they're progressive and that they want to reject all these old enlightenment ideas and just just be about oh let's just establish new hegemony but like it's we're very much in danger of especially with the left-wing sort of militant atheists are very they're very obsessed with tearing down things that built western society and like oh we're going to institute this new utopian in, uh, version using all these principles that we've just developed in the last couple of decades, which we have no understanding of what a long-term society built on those principles will be like. I mean, John Locke is probably the most credited philosopher with the development of the social contract. And so the, the social contract, just for, for anyone, I'm sure that you know what it is, but just for anyone who doesn't know, it's basically the idea that it's how societies operate naturally is that groups of individuals will come together 
agree to certain uh, infringements on their individual liberties. So they'll have to limit themselves in exchange for certain protections and that it's the legitimate role of government to um, to codify those into laws and to protect to protect those things. And I mean, even like like you're saying, it's it's like the, the left wing assumption that, oh, man, we need to be doing more for these people is is based in the social contract. And so they, like, they're being dishonest about the fact that they want to they want to reject all these old ideals and institute this new sort of cultural hegemony. The, the interesting thing about the, the the mainstream media is they try to force the the leftist worldview mm -hmm. on people, but uh, throughout the Western world, uh, conservatives they they win elections more often than not. I mean, in Australia, we've um, historically had the the coalition in power more than the Labor Party, and uh, in the recent in the last uh, fifty years in the United States, the uh, Republicans have been in power uh, longer th mm -hmm. than the Democrats, but. They're, they're supposed to be, you know, news media businesses, yet they're only catering to a minority, and it's just so bizarre. Yeah, there was a very um, telling... I can't remember who said this. It was on CNN. I think it was actually... Yeah, no, it was a... This was a writer for a student newspaper. It was it came out of the... Um, I forget what it's called, Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School, that big school shooting that all the um, David Hogg and all that, all the March for Our Lives stuff came out of. And she said on CNN um, that she sees the legitimate role of journalists as activists. And CNN was like, oh yeah, like totally, like we love that idea. And they tweeted it out and they sort of, they mass promoted it and they loved it. And that, I mean, that's just very telling about the whole thing. It's like they've moved from... Journalist, journalism has moved from being about presenting the facts in an objective way and like allowing people to make up their minds for themselves and it's turned into they're, they're just bloggers and I mean it's good for people like us because like you know it, people the more that that, ju that journalists do that the more people are going to go okay well I'm not listening to you I'm just going to like read some like genuinely independent people like us. So, I mean, it's good for us, but it's bad for the, it's very bad for the, the profession of journalism in general and our, like, our societal ability to discern truth from bullshit. Yeah, I, and I mean, the media's degenerated into, uh, CNN's the, the perfect example, by promoting uh, fake news uh, such as uh, that Trump uh, banned words from the Center for Disease Control, uh, then there's non-news, CNN uh, talked, you know, non-stop about Trump tweeting kefefe, I mean, it was... <laughs> spelling mistake and yet it was the the news for a day and then there's also selective outrage if uh if trump you know does uh, does something which is considered like not uh not the norm it's oh it's so, so outrageous but then we learned that um obama did something similar but it, but it was fine yeah i mean that i think the the complete flip of well, maybe not flip, the complete absence of the media's ability to recognize the way that they gave 95% positive coverage to Obama and then just completely 95% negative coverage to Trump and how insanely polarizing that is for the American society and then also Western society more broadly, obviously, because so much of the popular culture and news items that we consume are just, you know, straight through from American news channels and then just divide, like split amongst the other um, countries. Uh, that was definitely a part of what made me realize, like, we need to get into this. Like, I need to participate in this cultural fight. Like, I've got something to say here and I need to, I need to put out my views publicly. Um, because, yeah, I mean, it, it, like, it, almost any way you look at Obama's presidency, even like you can even see it here if you talk to an average person about american politics they're like oh man america just really wanted a third term for obama hey it's like not really i mean like <laughs> trump right now has higher approval ratings than what obama did at the same point in his presidency but you wouldn't you, if you just looked at the news you absolutely wouldn't see that like if you didn't go to america and speak to a bunch of people which obviously you know like no one does that unless you actually live in america no one here does that 
you, you would think that Obama was the perfect president and no one here who doesn't actively look into American politics and actively look into right-wing news sources knows nothing about how Obama tripled the deficit. He was literally droning targets in the Middle East daily and Trump's not. Like you would think that Trump was a legitimate warmonger the way that the the way that the media reacts to it. But in fact, it was Obama who was droning people daily and a, a, a Clinton presidency would have been a third term for Obama. It would have been more expansion of, of the government, more, um, I, I mean, there was, that's not even to mention, there was the IRS scandal as well. I mean, people should really look up that. That was, that was shocking. And now it's even coming out. Yeah, fast and Furious. Thing. Sorry? Fast and Furious. Yeah, yeah. Now And now it's even coming out the degree to which um, Obama had politicized the FBI so that it's, I mean, I don't want to speak too soon because this is still a developing story, but it's it's really starting to look like um, the FBI was spying on the Trump campaign before they've been publicly admitting that they were. And it's, it's starting to look really corrupt. Like, I think the Democrats are really, really sweating at this point. Now, I'm curious to know a bit more about how Medium works. Now, obviously, uh, there's no uh, startup costs with Medium. You simply just write write your thoughts and bang, it's on there. But uh, how do you get uh, gain a following on Medium? I mean, what's the reception been like to uh, pop and lock? Yeah, so Medium, for those who don't know, it's, I mean, I mean like all social media, it will, like, all successful social media platforms anyway it, it leans left it's it was made by one of the co-founders of twitter um and he i can't remember the quote but i remember just after the election he said he, he he's like expressed all these concerns of like same sort of thing as what mark zuckerberg said like he's like concerned about how his platform might have led to the rise of trump and like all this <laughs> scary you know scary stuff um but yeah it's it's so it's basically like imagine twitter but instead of the word limit you're like encouraged to do long form sort of blog writing so it's basically like that um i can't really tell the degree to which they show like the way that they prioritize conservative speech over left-wing speech but definitely like if, if like for example when you're a member on medium you get um i think it's I can't remember if it's daily or weekly, but you pretty regularly get emails of like, you know, here's some articles you might be interested in. And even though I'm very obviously a, a, a firm right winger, I get all these like feminist ones and all that kind of thing. So yeah. It might give um, you something to respond to. That's yeah, probably well, why. I mean, that's, that's what happens. So I, that's how I take it. Like there's, there's one, there's one on there called the nib, which it's basically third wave feminist um political cartoons and i like i did this thing the other day and i'm probably going to keep doing it where i took their cartoon that was like disparaging trump voters and i turned it into more reflective of reality so there was like one guy that was like like the top panel was like oh man these internet feminists are the worst they'll uh they'll ruin a guy's career just for saying that uh women should be back in the kitchen making babies and so i edited that panel to be they'll ruin a guy's career just for saying men and women are different because that's obviously what the actual conservative argument is if you're not caricaturing it <laughs> you're not you know out to be in bad faith but yeah no it's it's definitely like it's definitely a left-wing platform uh, but yeah not i mean like all social media they don't they don't publish how their algorithms work so it's virtually impossible for me to tell exactly how fair they are but my stuff does get a fair bit of traffic, so it, it's not as if they're suppressing it or anything. I, I do feel like I'm a bit shadow banned on Twitter, to be honest. Uh, Twitter's a whole whole nother story. Yeah. Uh, but Medium, they never remove articles. Let's like, say it doesn't follow. No, the they do. Oh, they do. They definitely do. It's not. It's not. I, I wouldn't characterize it as a fully free speech platform. No, like I said, the the guy who runs it and who founded it is very much one of these like oh man, we got to control the rise of the alt-right through social media. And, you know, of course they characterize alt-right as, like I said before, me thinking that I am entitled to keep my own money and that we should have like low, lower income tax rates and all that kind of stuff. They, there's a guy, I mean, to be fair, yeah, so there's a guy, you know, Mike Cernovic? He was... Yes. 
yeah, like he had a decent following on Medium and he was removed like probably, I think it was about six months ago. So he's probably the most high profile person that's been like outrightly banned. But to be fair to him, I mean, to be fair to Medium over that, I think it was largely due to um, he was being very Alex Jonesy on the whole Pizzagate thing. So I think I think that was why I didn't actually read his like what got him banned, but it was something along those lines. But there's there's other conservative writers. There was one there was a Swedish girl called Svetlana who did these she just did these awesome um, attacks. And she was she was by no means some sort of, you know, Alex Jones type figure or anything. She was just she would just pick apart um, third wave feminist arguments sort of line by line. And she got banned. I'm not entirely sure what for. But, you know, I'm sure that it was. Have you received, uh, like, a warning or anything no, like no, that? No. no. As far as I can tell, my stuff is at least still within the realms of acceptable discourse. It's still within the Overton window, if I can put it that way. But um, that, that may just be because, you know, I'm not as big as Mike Cernovic. I, I imagine that it had a lot to do with he was probably getting mass um, reported. Yeah, and it seems that um, a lot of social media companies have moved away from the explicit uh, censorship, and it was like what you were talking about before, the algorithms, like, you know, we'll probably, uh, because Facebook, for example, they were uh, deleting all these uh, popular uh, Facebook pages, such as, like, God Emperor Trump, that got taken down for a few mm. days, but after yeah. a backlash, uh, put back up. So uh, the the algorithm they use, that's a clever way of saying, of um, deciding, well, we don't like that that particular uh, page, so we're just going to put it down in the rankings. Oh, yeah, it's real creepy. It's really, really Orwellian, like absolutely Orwellian, the way that that works. Like, you can't see it. And, I mean, the, the irony is that, like, libertarians' hands are tied on it because we've, <laughs> we're the, like, oh, it's a private business, so private business can discriminate however it wants, guys. So, like, it's sort of, it's like, how can you argue with it? I mean, I've heard some decent libertarian arguments for why um, social media should be regulated in ways that other public utilities are, because clearly, twi like social media, Twitter and Facebook in particular, are like if you're a public figure, you can't survive, or even if you're a business, even if you're a small business owner, you, you virtually can't survive without full access and full fair access to Twitter and Facebook. So there's a decent case to be made for regulation just based on that. Yeah. I know the, the libertarians who uh, use the, um, you know, Twitter, Facebook, it's a private company. Uh, I, I always... Um... Uh, the, the types that say that uh, they they actually don't uh, don't like the the content that's being censored. So if it uh, goes away, then they uh, they use that you know libertarian principle to say, oh, it's justified. Now the other half of your uh, blog is uh, pop, which uh, stands for obviously popular culture, which is uh, a large part of uh, our society and uh, the main form of entertainment that uh, people consume. And of course, it is entirely uh, dominated by by the left or the the Hollywood celebrities uh, 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 of the left. Um, uh, uh, but it seems to be go. Uh, taking going a step further in that it's not just the you know celebrities you know support all these progressive causes but the uh you know movies and tv shows that that are being put out they're they're becoming more uh preachy openly um uh, spouting a progressive uh, agenda and then there's, of course there's the diversity movies such as the the female reboot of uh, ghostbusters and then and then of course the um you know, the blm movie black panther <laughs> yeah yeah that's pretty much that's pretty accurate um, <laughs> yeah so i mean to to speak to the the blm movie of black panther um it's it, it's it's really uh, it's awfully ironic and it's so, see this is another way like it's like what i was saying before that the the, philo the philosophical underpinnings of the left's ideas need to be explicitly called out and questioned because if you look at, at black panther what like for, this is going to probably 
not make much sense to people who haven't seen it. I'm sorry if you haven't seen it, but Wakanda, which is where it's set, is essentially an ethno-nationalist black hermit state. It's like, it's everything that, that the left claims to hate, but when black people do it, like when it's about African Americans or some victimized community, it's like, it's like, it's the greatest thing ever. It's the new civil rights movement. It's it's just absurd. And it's like, what, I mean, what message is that sending to young people? Because it's not, it's not like, it's not like Deadpool where it's got an R rating. Like Black Panther was watched by, you know, literally people of all ages and very young children. And it's like, what, what message are you sending them that the white society of America hates them and that they need to all band together and, you know, reclaim like Africa or some crap? Like it's absurd. Yeah. And, and of course they, they, they keep their, uh, uh, mineral, uh, terranium. They, they keep it a uh, secret because <laughs> otherwise the, the evil white colonizers will, will come <laughs> in and exploit it. That's the other thing is they were, oh man, like, there was an explicitly racist thing in that movie where, so you, you've seen it, right? Yes. There's, so there's this bit, there's that bit where um, Martin Freeman, I forget what he's, what character he's playing, but Martin Freeman's the guy from The Hobbit, so who played um, Bilbo, so he's a white guy, obviously, and he gets taken back to Wakanda, like he gets knocked out and they like heal him or something, and he walks out and he's like walking around their um, research lab and he's like looking at all this amazing uh, technology that he's never seen before because Wakanda is supposed to be like technologically superior and he's like looking at he's looking around at it all and the, the black girl goes oh colonizer yeah like it's like what like imagine if imagine if there was a movie and it was all about uh, a white hermit state and they had this black person in it and the black person just walks out and he's just looking around and someone was like the, a white character was like oh criminal it's like what it's it's racist like what and this is like a movie that's being sold to kids now, having said um, all this, I, I think it's important for people like us to uh, disassociate our politics from consuming entertainment because otherwise we're just going to have uh, no nothing left. Like for for example, like I you know despise uh, Meryl Streep's political views, but I think she's a really good actress and I enjoy you know watching uh, her movies. So you can't really I, I, I like I don't think that if like uh, a, you know, Hollywood or a, a musician, uh, f uh, for example, you know, spouts a, um, a left-wing idea, we, you know, need to go around, you know, burning their, you know, CDs or, or, or DVDs. No, absolutely. You do, you have to disassociate the art from the artist. Like, for example, I'm a big fan of, um, uh, Stephen King's writing and, uh, but I, I mean, you go on his Twitter, he's a absolutely a feral leftist. It's the, sa it's the same thing with Mark Hamill. Mark Hamill's out there on Twitter. He's literally spewing Democrat propaganda. I mean, he he should be Bernie Sanders' spokesperson for the twenty twenty elections, really. But but no, you, you you're right. You can't. We can't just go. Oh, we did a mass boycott Hollywood. Like that's obviously not it. We just have to put. Like I mean, we can. We just have to poke fun at it, really. And that I mean, it's becoming as it's become more overt. It's just becoming easier to do that to make fun of it. So whatever. It's all. It's all the better for people like us. Yeah, and, and uh, another good example of that is uh, Chris Christie, the governor of New Jersey. He's a big Bruce Springsteen fan, um, but obviously Springsteen, he's a, uh, a, 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 a American liberal. Uh, but it's it's good that um, Springsteen is reciprocal, saying you know I accept uh, Christie as a fan, even though you know I wouldn't vote for him. Yeah, there's been we saw a lot of nastiness around that when. Um, you remember that thing? It wasn't too long ago. It was probably about three months ago where Cory Bernardi... Oh, yeah, no, because it was Australia Day. Cory yes, Bernardi had a yes. day playlist and all these, like, Jimmy Barnes and all this were like, oh, you can't use my music. It's like, mate, that's not how culture works. Like... <laughs> Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, that that was a perfect example of like how insane it can get. Like, uh, yeah. uh, what if um, you know Corey Bernardi like shows up at Jimmy Barnes concert? Is he going to be uh, ejected? Like, but yeah, it, it's like... totally bizarre. Like, you're you're not allowed to enjoy my entertainment, or like I don't want to you know accept uh, a large a, a large amount of the the public's money because I disagree with them politically. 
yeah, it's pretty, that's pretty feral. But yeah, I mean, I mean, like I said, it's just, the more that they do that, the more absurd they make themselves look and the more that they betray, I mean, again, to go back to the thing I said about the underlying philosophies, it, it makes you realize how bullshit the um, left's claim that they're for like inclusivity and all this it's, is, you know, it's like, it's not like Cory Bernardi is out, you know, lynching the gays or something like he's not david duke he's just a conservative politician <laughs> it's it's not like he needs to be denounced and you have to say like no you're not allowed to listen to music if you you know are a conservative christian like what yeah it's the, the the problem with with trying to you know change this you know group thinking entertainment is that the they're, they're still, despite uh, the, the growth of the internet, uh, uh, you can post um, entertainment on YouTube, is that the, the gatekeepers still exist. And if you don't have the uh, politically correct uh, opinion, for, uh, um, then I was just using an example, like Stephen Crowder applied to you know, be a correspondent on The Daily Show, but you know, it was rejected because <laughs> obviously he was uh, a, a conservative, that they, they'll still only let into to, you know, give people their their big break if they're they're of the same view. Mm, yeah, I mean, you can see that with the um, the ABC comedy thing. I mean, it's like you've you made this observation to me. I don't know if you you might have written it in some articles on the Unshackled as well, but the, it, it's concerning because a, the ABC very much has a, has a stranglehold on. The next generation of comedians and so it's, it's like you said they're they're essentially cultivating the next generation of comedians and if, if the next generation of australian comedians are these politically correct absurdly unfunny people who are just making these bizarre videos like in the abc comedy videos that are being shared by meme pages even internationally it's like it does damage to our whole international reputation the whole you know stand-up comedy um industry of australia oh that's a whole nother issue that's uh, government uh, funding uh the arts i mean that, mm, uh, that yeah. just uh picking you know winners and losers in any industry i mean that just uh, cripples the the innovation and of course diversity in it diversity in a good that's, sense yeah i mean and uh, that's another area where I very much was, I, I realized I was in the wrong camp when I was younger and I was a, a bit of a left, a bit of a, a libertarian lefty. Um, yeah, because if you, like, if I express the opinion, like, man, why is the government funding the arts? Like, the arts should be completely privately funded, which I think is a completely normal view to take. Like, I don't understand why people legitimately think that government, like, I understand that I understand that it has a limited degree of funding, but like we have all these business channels now, like the internet has completely revolutionized the marketplace and the way that economics works. And if you, if we were to roll back government funding of the arts, it, it's not as if people wouldn't fund it themselves. You know what I mean? Yeah, uh, exactly. Now, I but will... if you have that worldview, it's like you're rejected from the left like that's a like that's me saying oh man we should have this society with no art like no that's not it at all i just don't want you to steal my money to make me pay for abc comedy bullshit now i thought i'd finish off by asking you where do you think where we're heading in the in the future i mean uh obviously the the left have been on the march for for a number of years and they're they're reaching their their pinnacle in um their uh, demands and um, uh, what they're what they're spouting out in the media, but the the, the fight back against them has uh, it's it, it's really uh, I, I'd <clears throat> I, I'd say shot up, um, and I think it's also making an impact most importantly in the uh, political class. I mean, we're we're getting as 
you know, some politicians now who you know aren't afraid of you know offending the uh, uh, the media and the, the the cultural elite. I mean, obviously Donald Trump is the the, the standout there, but in Australia we also have. Um, people like Peter Dutton and Cory who, um, who, who, you know, just just don't care if like they're they're, they're not uh, looked upon uh, uh, flattering by the, you know, on social media and by you know websites such as uh, Junkie and that. And uh, we we are starting to get um, some pushback uh, against you know the the left's identity politics. There's been a huge backlash to the, you know this. Uh, uh, gender and you know sexuality, you know diversity, madness, and um, you know there's been a real rallying for, to keep Australia Day on January 26. I think where the kind of red line for a lot of people is is where it's getting to now. It's where it gets into the schools, where it gets into okay, here's what the government is going to intrude on in terms of you raising your children. I think once once you get to the we're going to like we know better than you how to raise your children i think that's where a lot of people uh, and a lot of parents obviously but people generally who who, are, who see a future in you know raising a family in this country really draw the line so i, th I think like you're right that it's it's had this sort of un, un um unimpeded march towards the left but i i actually do think that it's starting to get to the end point once it gets into schools like the, yeah. And then of course, uh, we're doing our bit in this um, battle. I mean, you, you've uh, run a successful blog on Medium and uh, The Unshackled, we've been around for for 18 months now and there, there's plenty, I mean, if you just look at how the, you know, anti-SJW, mm -hmm. anti-feminist, um, you know, con the content on YouTube has like, exploded over the, uh, over the yeah. past two years. Yeah, definitely. I mean, uh, another another area where I'm fairly positive for, for people of our generation and the younger generations is um, a lot of kids now play video games. Like, video games are sort of becoming more popular with each successive generation. And video, even though, like, the sort of TV and movies controlled popular culture, like Hollywood, um, leans left because Hollywood leans left, and it's not as if game developers don't also lean left. They do. All, like most creative industries do. But I think that video games are naturally a bit more of a libertarian medium, like popular culture medium in their very nature. They involve meritocracy. They involve um, skill-based progression, reward systems for the top players. Um, there's an increasing emphasis on individualized stories um you you collect property you own weapons i mean if you look at things like gta which are like the most popular video games they're basically and and kapistan if i can <laughs> if i can put it that way so i, I think that i think that that I, I mean i'm not saying every kid should play video games and that's how we're going to win the culture wars but i am saying that i think that the younger generations are rejecting the top-down authoritarianism of the the older generations and the way in which which the older generations are rejecting sort of enlightenment libertarian first principles, if you know what I mean. Yeah, uh, you're exactly right there. So the other way in which I'm pretty positive about the future outlook is that there's, I've seen a lot of evidence that the next generation, like my generation, and I think you and I would be in the same generation, ours is fairly social justice-y, but the next generation, there's actually a lot of evidence that they're, much more conservative so i think you what we're seeing is an interesting thing where sort of the counterculture from like the 70s i guess up until the late 2000s was to be against right-wing authoritarianism now it's becoming obvious that there's a left-wing authoritarianism and so people are becoming sort of right-wing libert like young people are becoming right-wing libertarian because that's the counterculture yeah yeah, exactly. I Which mean, a, uh, a really uh, interesting yeah, I, I mean, children always want to, you know, rebel. And if they're told, mm. you know, this is how you must think on, on these social issues, uh, because, you know, we say so. And if you, if you don't, you're, you know, you're horrible, you know, bigot, then young people are going to say, no, I'm not going to accept that. 
yeah, and that's, I mean, that seems to be exactly what's happening. Well, I've enjoyed chatting with you today, uh, Jack. I'm, I'm looking forward to uh, working with you uh, in, the, in the future. So, um, yeah, we'll, we'll definitely keep in touch. And, yeah, I'd love to have you back on the show sometime. Yeah, sure. I'd be, I'd be delighted to come back. All right, everybody, that's the show for today. Don't forget, tickets are now on sale for the big tour by Stefan Molyneux and Lauren Southern in Australia this July. They'll be visiting Sydney, Melbourne, Adelaide, Perth and Brisbane, as well as Auckland. The tour is being hosted by new events company Axomatic Events. Please make sure to grab your place before they sell out by visiting axomatic.events. Lauren and Stefan promise to make a big impact to our national discussion while they are here, and we at the Unshackled are certainly looking forward to it. Axomatic is launching with a splash. If you're in Brisbane, you can meet the famous Mama Warrior against Unsafe Schools, Political Posting Mama, aka Marie Carancy. In person, she'll be appearing at the Mount Gravitz Bowls Club at 7pm on Thursday the 21st of June. Tickets can be purchased at axomatic.events slash politicalpostingmama. The True Blue Cruise annual Aussie Pride Flag March is nearly upon us. It was one of the first events we covered out in the field in Melbourne last year, and we'll be back again there this year. The date is Sunday the 24th of June at 12 p.m. and begins in the, at the Royal Exhibition Building. This type of event probably matters more now than ever given the persecution of nationalists we are seeing in the Western world, so please come along and don't be deterred by the campaign against racism and fascism who always counter-protest this type of event. Also, don't forget, if you want to take The Unshackled even further and score some awesome rewards, please consider becoming a patron at patreon.com slash The Unshackled. Don't forget, we have our online store, Upright Market, where you can purchase Unshackled merchandise and other gear for right-thinking people. So thanks once again for your company, and we'll see you next time. Thanks for tuning in to The Unshackled Waves. Please visit theunshackledwaves.net for all the ways to subscribe and follow the show. Don't forget to pick up your free ebook at theunshackledbattlefield.net and keep checking out theunshackled.net for all the latest news and commentary.